Um, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to our candidate forum for Senate and House District 65, 65. My name is Kitty Weston, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis, and I'm a trained moderator. Today's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul in partnership with the St. Paul um, NAACP and the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. The success of our state depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office in Minnesota. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate candidates and the audience members for taking the time to be here tonight. The candidates participating in today's forum have all agreed to the forum rules, which were included in their invitation to participate. Each candidate will be given a two-minute introductory statement. The candidates will have one minute to answer questions. Rebuttals are only allowed if a candidate is called out by name by another candidate and will be timed to 30 seconds. Candidates will be, will be given a two-minute closing statement. A timer will signal them when they have 30 seconds remaining and when their time is up. There are postcards on your chairs and the audience is welcome to ask questions and we have volunteers that will collect them and bring them to me. This forum is being, being video recorded by St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. Recording of the forum will stream live and appear on multiple platforms. The League of Women Voters sponsors candidate forums to provide the public with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss the issues that are important to members of the public. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. The views expressed in each forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. Um, League of Women Voter posts complete unedited recordings of forums. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums will, may not be used for partisan political purposes. <coughs> with that, we will start with opening statements. Candidates, you each have two minutes for an opening statement. With that, we'll begin. Let's begin with um, candidate Holmgren. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Paul Holmgren. I'm running for State Senate. And uh, I have a simple message, but first a little bit about myself. Uh, married, husband of uh, 14 years, five kids, married a package deal, kids from college to first grade. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. Three things I focus on when I talk to people or people talk to me is public safety, simpler taxes, and fewer regulations. Most of the issues faced in our state can be boiled down to one of those three items. First, I believe in that we should be safe in all the things we do in public as long as we're fo following the laws. And well, it's our job to take care of ourselves, if it's beyond our reach, we should feel safe and have the ability to, to uh, have the, the police response when needed, hopefully rarely. Second, sim simpler taxes. I should be able to explain the tax code to my kids on the back of a piece, piece of paper at the di dinner table. Unfortunately, the tax preparer for the last seven years full time, it's tough to explain taxes to most of my clients, which is why I have a business. Third is fewer regulations. For far too long, the burden of starting a business or owning a business is that it's too complicated. And even if you have a great idea, it's tougher to get your concept to market because of the r rules that are set by the government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senate candidate Pappas. First, I'd like to thank the League and the NAACP and SPIN for sponsoring this event today. And welcome to all the audience members who have joined us and to everyone at home. I'm Senator Sandy Pappas, and I also want to thank Paul for joining us tonight. He reminds me that we first met 
When he was a teenager, he was 17, he came to visit the Capitol. So it's nice to see you again 30 years later, Paul. Um, I'm running for re-election because there's just so much work that needs to be done at the Capitol. In order to get that work done, we really have to keep the Democrats in the majority in the House and keep the governor and flip the Senate to the DFL. I can just go down the list. Um, we have a homelessness and affordable housing problem that needs serious to be seriously addressed. We have a shortage of child care providers and child care is too expensive. Uh, we really need to protect women's reproductive health. Um, we have, we're behind in our infrastructure, which is something that I work a lot on. We need universal health care. We have a climate crisis and we need to address racial equity in all of those different areas. So I'm excited to go back to the Capitol in January and start working on all these important issues and hope to have the support of the voters and constituents in my district. Thank you. Thank you. Um, House District 65A, candidate Frost. Good evening, everybody, and I want to thank you all for being here, uh, especially everybody up here that's running for these very important seats that, you know, the community definitely needs um, good people at. Um, who am I? I'm a native of St. Paul, Minnesota, of this very district, 65A. Um, I've been here 50 years. I've watched my community from being that great community where you could leave your doors unlocked and your bike at the corner and go back the next day and still be there. But those times have changed. Due to the crime and due to, you know, the, the values and the, the things that the community has no longer put in forth, we need to make a change, and I'm here to help make that change. So what have I done? I am a, a program director. I'm a mentor. I've created a, a center, 8218 True Center, which is a place where kids can have a safe space to go and, and learn what it takes to become profitable adults and be the ones that we need to have our future leaders be. Um, I'm an outreach worker with the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department. I'm the public safety chair of the NAACP. Um, that's just the name of a few of the things, but the most important thing that I am is I'm a father. I'm a father and I'm a husband. I have five beautiful kids, but I'm a father to so many more because in my community centers, I have kids from all backgrounds of life, kids from all different ethnicities that are there to just try to seek some type of help to be loved, to be cared about. So when I say I have five biological kids, well, I do, but I have a lot more. And those are my community kids that I am running on this platform to try to make sure that I have and give a voice to and for. So that's why I'm here today to make sure that we can start to have the people that are from these communities start to represent these communities. And I thank you and I look forward to letting you know more about me and my platform. Thank you. Um, House District 65A candidate Schoenbaum. Thank you. And thank you to my opponent. He sounds like a, a wonderful guy. And I would look forward to uh, being his representative in the State House. And I would look forward to, if you win, I would be a, a good member of your constituency. So I look forward to working with you either way. We'll find out in November how that goes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is John Schoenbaum, and running for Minnesota State House 65A for the Republican Party. Um, 57 years in Minnesota, my whole life. Um, grew up in North St. Paul, graduated 83. Um, last 30 years, my wife and I have lived in a home. It was a HUD repo in one of those kind of housing troughs. It was a large, messy old house. It was converted into five or six apartments on Marshall Avenue. And we have been there 30 years and I think we're getting closer to done. We, another 30 years, we might be done. Um, my wife and I met in the first National Bank building, that big, neat Art Deco building downtown with the one on top of it kind of spins around. We worked third shift. I worked in the sorter room and she worked in the proof. We kind of slogged away third shift doing kind of grunt work and uh, we met each other and it was a wonderful thing. We have four kids together. We've been at our home for 30 years. Um, our kids have gone to school in St. Paul. We have gone to church in St. Paul. Um, I have worked in St. Paul. St. Paul companies. Um, I've gotten to know a lot of folks in my neighborhood, a really wide variety of people, wonderful people, 
teachers, students, mothers, fathers, clerks, bankers, carpenters, clergymen, preachers, nurses, the list is endless. Um, and reassuring, the people of St. Paul can do anything, and they can do everything. We are a very resourceful people in this town. It's kind of a, I, I think of it as a, a big small town. And I look forward to being a, a part of this wonderful town, continuing to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, House District 65B candidate, Perez Hedges. Buenas tardes, good evening. My name is Maria Isa Perez Hedges. I am a youth worker in this great state of Minnesota that has been serving our youth since I was a youth 16 years ago. Um, I currently direct mentorship programming for after school programming with the Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project, serving St. Paul youth in Dayton's Bluff, as well as Frogtown and my beloved West Side community. I have been raised my entire life and am raising a three-year-old girl on the west side of St. Paul. I'm also a rapper, singer, songwriter, uh, known as to NPR, one of the top 52 artists in the state. And I hold that with pride as a Latina and CEO of Soto Rico LLC, a Latinx record label since 2009 in the state of Minnesota as a small time business owner that represents other artists that has thrown several events through nationally and that licenses music internationally through my independent business. Uh, I'm a type one diabetic. I have been since I was 16 years old, insulin dependent. I am the posse lead for the Minnesota Insulin for All chapter, which was the first in grassroots organizing in the country to pass the Insulin Affordability Act, also known as Alex Law, back in 2019, in 2020, um, in the middle of the pandemic. I look forward to leading and representing our District 65B as someone that has been a part of the community, active in the community. Rose recently uh, organizing our youth who have been traumatized uh, from mental crisis in gun violence, that have been traumatized through this opiate crisis, that have been traumatized by not having enough teachers of color in their schools to teach cultural competency. And as a Puerto Rican who knows my African and indigenous blood as well as the colonized blood, I look forward to representing those youth that need to be told the truth so that we can excel and reach our highest potential in this state. Gracias. Thank you very much, candidates. Um, one thing, all the candidates need to answer every question. So if you have a specific question for a district that will just apply to one or two candidates, I would encourage you to wait till after the forum and ask that question. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. Okay, let's get on to the questions. Um, we're gonna start with um, uh, you, candidate uh, Perez Hedges. The first question is, what would your top three priorities be if elected? We need to talk about accessible and affordable health care for all. Uh, something that's very near and dear to me as I expressed in my opening statements that I'm type one diabetic. I've known, what it's felt, I've, I've known what it's felt like to have to ration my insulin when I turned 18 and was off of my parents' insurance. Those decisions should not have to be made. It should be accessible. And also the mental capacity of what we've been dealing with as a youth worker in school and after school, I see the needs that our kids need. We can't talk about education, we can't talk about housing if we don't take care of the sector of health, especially in the racial disparities that happen in our black and brown and indigenous communities. We need to focus on health and education. We also need to focus on housing. Those three sectors are braided into the issues of health care. Thank you. Um, candidate Frost, could you answer that same question? What would your top three priorities be? We definitely have to focus on the youth. No one is focusing on the youth. I mean, in, in, in the community, it's the youth are the ones that's the problem. That's not true. The youth are the ones that are screaming out, asking for help. They're the ones that are asking each and one of us for the resources that politics continue to play a game on our communities and strip these kids away from those resources that's greatly needed. Uh, we want to talk about community. Well, we need to get back to that community where we all was that true village that we all once had and you know uh, earned to go and try to create again. 
um, economic development. We want to make sure that we can start to develop some, you know, whether it's resource centers, whether it's housing for the homeless, whether it's, you know, places where, you know, the average family can just get something to eat, you know, and be able to not be embarrassed by going to get that food, but just be able to have that resource there, you know, for them at need without needing to go to the grocery store and spend $6 for a carton of eggs. Thank you. Um, uh, candidate Pappas. Yeah, thank you for that excellent question. Um, uh, I have a couple, I have many priorities, so I'll try to narrow them to three. Um, paid sick days, earned sick and safe time is really important to me. I've been working on that for quite a few years, and along with that is paid medical leave. You know, we're one of the, uh, we're the only ad so-called advanced industrial country that doesn't provide paid medical and family leave for parents and to take care of a newborn child or also if someone is ill in your family. I mentioned earlier the housing crisis, so infrastructure stuff is real important to me. Um, I am in line if the Senate is in the majority to be chairing that committee, and so all kinds of housing options need to be on the table. And finally, criminal justice reform, both uh, looking at what the Second Chance Coalition has been advancing as well as legalizing marijuana and expungement and juvenile justice reform. Thank you. Um, candidate uh, Holmgren. Thank you. <clears throat> I already gave you my top three, so I'll refine it. Uh, fewer regulations and uh, how that looks is uh, our property taxes shouldn't be going up on the backs of homeowners. We need to restore our property tax base around the state, but also in the cities where we live, West St. Paul and St. Paul, and uh, bring the businesses back into the cities. You shouldn't have to drive to the suburbs for a good job, which happened when I was in my 20s and all the jobs were gone. So fewer regulations that allow young people and old people and middle-aged people to start businesses right in the co communities where we live. Also, just Public safety would be the second one there. So make it safe so we can live and work close to our, where we choose to live. Thank you. Um, candidate Schoenbaum. Thank you. Top three priorities. Um, public safety is very important. I think we've all mentioned uh, we need to figure out how not only to decrease crime but inspire those people that might be committing crimes that there's other things to do. We need opportunities, we need business opportunities, we need better places of employment, we need better schools, we need schools that inspire them in a way that is productive. We need lower taxes. We need to attract business to St. Paul. I'm not sure how many businesses have left St. Paul in the last three years, but it, it's been a lot. They've been leaving for the past 30, 40 years. And it is hard to support a government without business, without people paying taxes, without providing employment for people that are looking for it. Education. We need good education for our kids. It is incredibly important to give the kids the best education that they can possibly get. Thank you very much. Um, okay, moving on, we are going to, let's see, okay. Um, representative, or uh, candidate Jombaum, I'm gonna put you on the spot again. Flavors and menthol um, in tobacco products are used to target youth. Do you support ending the sale of flavored and menthol tobacco products? not a smoker, so I don't really, it, it doesn't hit me hard, but it seems odd to target smoking products to children. That, that doesn't seem like a good thing to me to do. I, making, I don't know, appealing to child impulses for something that is not healthy is, is, is not a good thing, so I would have to think about that. I, I guess I would seriously consider something in that regard, yeah. Thank you. Um, candidate Perez-Hedges, same question. 
I worked, uh, gosh, it's been almost 15 years on a campaign with the Youth Latino Initiatives to end tobacco sales of, of flavors and, and highlight um, what happens to our lungs and our children without knowing. It's something that is a chain. It's a cycle. It's a systemic chain that targets our communities of color. So we need to talk about how we can put more money in focusing on having healthier lives instead of promoting products that are killing our children and our elders. Gracias. Uh, Senate candidate Pappas. Yes, I would support banning flavored tobacco. Okay. For all the reasons that's, that have been stated. Uh, Senate candidate Holmgren. Well, I'm not in favor of more regulations, but I don't think it should be a free-for-all where anybody can go buy anything they want. So education begins at home. I don't smoke, uh, so I don't consume those products that are even let my kids buy candy. Now, I'm not so strict about that, but this is where personal choice comes in. I don't think the government has a place telling people what they should sell Certainly, they should be restricted to adults, but that's already in the law. So I don't see the need for further restriction here. I forgot to add, I didn't use all my, my minutes, that uh, one of the first bills I authored when I was in the House was to ban candy cigarettes. Can you believe there used to be candy cigarettes? And I, I don't think I, that we weren't successful I with do doing that. I do remember those, and you'd puff them and yes. they'd blow out the dust. Yeah, well, I don't think they allow them anymore, but I don't think we were successful, and we weren't successful in doing that, but the manufacturers did realize it was a bad idea. Okay. Um, candidate Frost. Yes, I agree definitely on uh, banning those flavored um, tobacco products. Uh, not just because of it being aimed at the kids, but we have to, as a community and uh, as a city, state, and as America, start to help each other with health, just period. So if we can start to eliminate some of those things that are you know, causing a lot of us to lose these battles with cancer and just with health, we need to focus in on what it takes to do that, and that's one of the steps going forward that I believe we need to do. Thank you. Um, okay, candidate Frost. The audience member wanted to thank you all for coming tonight, and I um, wanted to talk about families with special needs kids, what kind of resources, programs, um, Sorry, I'm not able to read the last part of this question. Oh, 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 okay. Um, so looking at, and the tons of paperwork. Mm. So I think, so, so, <laughs> sorry about that. So I think that the question is um, to say something about about how you could address the um, issues that families that have children with disabilities face, um, and including, and I believe this is, if I'm wrong, correct me, um, what kind of resources and programs are, could be made available, and is there a way to um, eliminate some of the paperwork that goes along with applying for any of those kind of programs? Well, I believe that first we have to let uh, these families know that those resources are out there. Um, there's a lot of resources that are there, but they're not being promoted in those areas to the families that really need to be able to take, uh, you know, take uh, those resources and work with them. So first we need to educate these communities with the, the knowledge of that these resources are out there. And um, it's, it's just too many families are feeling like if they are putting their kids in, in these resources that a lot of the state and the government is being invasive when it comes to uh, their family core values or whatnot. So we need to make sure that, you know, these families can uh, know that you can place your kids or you can get the resources that you need without being in fear that the government or the state will, you know, be invasive when it comes to you and, and your family. Thank you. Um, candidate Holmgren. Thank you. Uh, 
So first thing we need to do is get rid of the stigmatism that, I hate to say it, it comes, that's the first thing in mind is special needs, chil chil children. And so to echo what Mickey just said, the programs are avail available. We need to cut the red tape to them. We need to make them more efficient so it doesn't take months or even years to get the support that some of them need. And it needs to be structured in such a way that they can either purchase them through an HSA plan, so employee, employer employee plans need to be improved so that if they're a healthcare product, it's easier to pay for, and that the price is brought down through comp competition for those ser services. Thank you. Um, candidate Schoenbaum. I've heard good things from all of these candidates. We need to promote the family, because families are incredibly important in, in the city of St. Paul. And helping families deal with difficulties with their children, the most important thing in their lives, is incredibly important. But we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We, we do that all the time. We have a new program. We forget about the one that we just had, three of them that we had the, the year before that were created. These programs and these, these monies have been invested, and they have to be utilized, and they have to be promoted in a way that people know where they are, and they have access to them. We, it's incredibly important, and it's, we need to utilize the, the resources that we already have best way that I can say it. Thank you. Um, candidate uh, Perez Hedges. There are resources there, but it's hard to find those resources when you don't have accessibility to translation services, folks that are culturally competent with the household from religious, you know, uh, barriers that may be placed and language barriers. Mm -hmm. We have resources amongst counties, but we're short staffed there. Folks aren't getting phone calls back. We need to really have conversations in the communities of these parents and the family members and those with special needs that are of age, that are adults, on what's best and what works for them. We need to make sure that um, those services from the county are being translated, are being uh, seen in our communities. Not everybody reads the same paper, not everybody has the resources to the internet or to a phone to access Google. You know, so where in the community do we need them? They need to come to the community. There needs to be representation that those resources are there, but how, how do we know that they're there if there's not marketing of that, if there's no communication and leadership with that? Thank you. Uh, Senate candidate Pappas. Thank you again for that question. There definitely is a mental health crisis, especially among youth. And one of the few bipartisan bills that the legislature passed last year was to significantly, significantly fund mental health treatment programs. Um, if the questioner wants to talk to me after the forum, I can have my staff do some research and find out what programs are out there. You should all know that your legislators are available to help you with that, as, el as well as your county commissioners because uh, there are multiple programs and we just need to get the, um, get the research and get that out to the community. Thank you, candidates. Um, okay, so next question. Do you support reparations for the American descendants of chattel slavery, um, Senate candidate Pappas? Um, yes, I do. I think that's a very important conversation we need to have and we need to put some money behind that discussion. Um, I've been involved with the Reconnect Rondo group and hoping that we were researching whether a land bridge would be a possibility to reconnect the Rondo community as a part of reparations. But I think we need to go beyond that. We certainly have in the housing crisis, we know that the African American home ownership is about 30% compared to 70% in the white community. Why is that? Um, years of, of redlining and discrimination against the ability to get housing loans. And we also know we have a huge educational gap in our educational field between our posse communities and the white community, which has been an ongoing problem that uh, certainly needs to be severely addressed as well. So yes, in terms of reparations in all areas. Uh, candidate Schoenbaum. Reparations is a very difficult thing to even address. Who, who gets what amount? From whom is, are these amounts paid? 
we need to address the needs of people today. We need to address the needs of people who don't have homes today. We need to address the needs of people who are feeling minimized today. There are many ways to do that, and moving cash back and forth is a difficult proposition. <clears throat> we need to treat everybody equally. We need to treat everyone with respect, with kindness and consideration. But delineating those things based on skin color is, is not my way of doing it. Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. As a proud Puerto Rican, Afro Boricua, our roots speak. If we are trying to break oppressive cycles, we have to give back to those cycles that have been oppressed. Um, you can't talk to me about it's not based off color. We live in a system that has been built, okay? The, the, the infrastructure, our economy has been built on the backs and the blood and sweat and tears of African people, okay? Of a diaspora that is living strongly. And we also need to talk about our indigenous communities with our black and brown and indigenous communities. Reparations is most necessary in a cycle to move forward for justice in this system of democracy. Thank you. Um, uh, candidate Frost. Yes, reparations is, is definitely something that's needed. If not just for the people of uh, African descent, we must make it available for any and everybody that has a history of putting America on their back and making sure that this country is that great country that it's turned out to be. It wasn't done just one-sided. It's a lot of people that have, you know, through these years put our country on their back to make sure that it, it's where it is to this day here. Um, we need to educate some of those people that can make these changes for reparations and let them understand that when we talk reparations, we're not just talking about cash. It's not just about cash. It, you know, it's about a whole system being changed in order to make sure that as people, we all can become that one uh, America that we all claim that we yearn to want to become. But unfortunately, we're so divided in a place where we claim that we want to be as one. How can that be? Reparations is definitely something that we need to explore. Thank you. Um, candidate Holmgren. Uh, on the face of reparations, just we found out from COVID, just writing people checks, one-time money is not the way to do it. Uh, it has to be stru structural. Uh, first thing we have to do is keep the American dream alive for all people, not just those who have it or those who figured it out. And that's, I heard, heard it already. Education, you know, I mean, the first thing I was taught, not the first thing, but one of the most memorable things I was taught was self-esteem. Now, I don't want to go down that trail. We don't have time. but. If we don't know who we are or where we came from, we can't deal with what position we're in, no matter our background. Okay. Thank you. Um, candidate Holmgren, I'm going to ask you the next question. So what role does the legislator play in fixing the economic disparities of black Americans in the city of St. Paul? Well, uh, I remember reading about Rondo and the destruction of 16 to 20 or more square blocks of the city to have a landing zone for all the, the equipment to run a highway through, which whether it should or should be there is a discussion long past. Um, It breaks my heart that they did it the way they did it. Now, can I go back 70 years and change it? Do I have an answer at this moment? Apology, I don't. But it goes back to what I said before. We need to level the ground so African Americans or any culture that has been disparaged or abused by the culture can restore their standing and improve their lives. Thank you. Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. 
Can you please repeat the question? I was a little thrown off by his yeah. answer. Um, what role does the um, what role does the state legislature legislature play in fixing the economic disparities for Black Americans in St. Paul? We've got to fight as legislators and prioritize um, Black businesses, especially coming from the roots and the history of this neighborhood that we're right in on the Rondo community that was torn apart. We look at the history of Tulsa and Harlem Renaissance as we had a Renaissance here in St. Paul less than 100 years ago. So why are we not focusing as legislatures, as future legislators is what I'm gonna speak into existence, to prioritize on the people who built this community, on the people who built businesses, on the people that have history here. We need to focus on creating those spaces of history to be taught. When we see where we come from, we grow together. This is not about just separating this, this area of boxes, this circling. And I look at the black community as my community, even though I'm from the west side, because there wouldn't be a west side built infrastructure if it wasn't for the influence of the Rondo community. We have to prioritize on representing that history and supporting it economically. Uh, candidate Schoenbaum. In order to address the problems of economic disparity, we have to inspire, we have to educate, we have to have economic development. People that have been disadvantaged need to be provided advantages. The people that have been disparaged need to be given the ability to do the things that they feel that they need to do. Businesses, schools, churches, they need things not given to them, but opportunity for them to do the things that they know that they need done. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, candidate Frost. We have to be honest. We have to do what we say we're gonna do when we're on these platforms right here and we're searching for these votes and we're promising the people out there that we're gonna make these changes and we're gonna do this. We can't get into those leadership positions and then drop the ball. We have to be able to take those people that we promise to make changes for and get those changes done. And how do we do that? We get with other constituents, we get with other legislators, and we sit there and we talk to them and we try to create these, these bonds, we try to create these relationships and get away from that division that has caused us throughout our whole state to start to see something that is kind of a repeat of the 40s and the 50s again. You know, it's like more relevant now than it was back then to see the hatred and the disconnect and the dishonesty that these legislators are having when it comes to keeping their promises with the American people and the people here of our state. So we have to be honest. Um, candidate Pappas. Yeah, we do have a responsibility. The legislature should be funding um, programs to address economic disparities in St. Paul, and we do, but it's often just not enough. So we've already, we've been talking about Reconnect Rondo, so Representative Moran and I got $6.2 million in planning dollars for that project and outreach. We um, certainly can provide dollars to um, small businesses of color, African American businesses through DEED and other economic development programs like at the neighbor, Neighborhood um, Development Corporation um, education, certainly education disparities, um, there's funding for that. It's just probably not enough. That, like I said, it's just not enough to really address the problem. And um, housing programs, certainly helping first time home buyers get into a home and training them and, and educating them on how to take care of a home. Those are programs that have been funded by the state. Just that there could be many more that are also funded by the state and we should be doing that. Um, candidate Pappas, I'm going to ask you the next question. So what is your position regarding the legal age to purchase handguns? Currently it's 18. Should it stay the same or should it be raised and why? Well, that's a pretty narrow question about the whole issue of uh, gun safety legislation. So yes, I would say it should be raised. I also think it should be more difficult to get a handgun. What, what do people need handguns for anyway? We're not talking about hunting, right, which is a very rural Minnesota thing. I, we have a prolifer proliferation of handguns that are available, both legal and illegal. 
And handguns are more likely to be used against the person than to be used in their self-defense, and they're more likely to be used for suicide. So stricter control of who gets guns and, and for what purpose. Um, red flag laws, so when someone's mentally ill, you can get a court order to take the gun away from them. Uh, closing loopholes in terms of background checks. There's a lot of work we can do on gun safety. Candidate Frost. I think that we should raise the, the, the limit due to the fact that, I mean, when the younger you are, the less you really understand life. You're not quite there, you know. So mentally, you know, it, it does take uh, education. It does take some time. And a lot of times we see that so a lot of these younger kids are getting their hands on firearms and they're using it in the worst way. So, you know, definitely we need to make sure that that age is raised enough where, you know, it gives uh, these young adults time to take uh, gun classes or just learn what, what uh, the firearm is really meant to do and how it is, you know, supposed to be there to protect and, and, and um, not just to be used as, and it's too many video games that are showing these kids that are using guns, just not really understanding the full potential on what that firearm could do. So we definitely need to raise those ages and at the same time more educate, whether it's in school or whatnot, to make sure that these kids understand what they're facing and what they're doing when they have a handgun in their possession. Candidate Holmgren, same question. Uh, as far as raising the age, I think that should be the last thing we do. I think training and education, um, a gun is not a toy, it never was a toy, it never has been a toy. Uh, are there other, there's other steps. We have many, many gun laws, state and fed, federal, that are on the books. If we enforce those and then if there's a gun crime, then there should be training or, or training or as required as a condition of those those gun crimes. So it, it's not just raising the age will not fix the problem. Uh, candidate Schoenbaum. And gun crime is committed boy, almost entirely by people who have acquired guns illegally. That needs to be addressed. How do people in that situation get a gun? Where do these guns come from? We need to find that out. We need to have education. We need to have everyone understand what this tool is. It's not a tool, it's, it's a very dangerous item. If you're going to sell a dangerous item to somebody, they should have training. We have a lot of rules about that and I think we need to enforce the rules that we already have because it is it's an incredibly powerful thing that we, that we have in guns and it's, it's Yes, we, we need to address how those things go wrong illegally. Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. Yes, I mean, you 18 years old, it's like accessibility to go to a fleet farm and go buy a gun without even knowing what that gun's harm can do. That gun's harm, I'll tell you what it could do. It shot and killed a constituent in my district, a friend who just did security, who was trained just yesterday. Somebody firing a gun. There's too many guns. I've lost too many friends and close people in our community due to gun violence. For folks that act like this isn't an issue, you need to wake up and step up. For folks that act that kids are traumatized and hiding underneath their school desk as like it's a tornado drill while they're in school because an uh, underage kid is walking around their school with a gun, too many lockdowns that you don't hear about on the news every day. We definitely need to make sure that there is a, a, a legal age that is not 18 to get a gun and that the accessibilities to gun violence is, is dismantled by the system that puts so much money into militarizing our children. Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, what is your position on no bail for violent offenders and why? Um, and then another part of that question is, do you have any statistical data that proves no bail for violent offenders works? Is it effective or not effective? Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. No. <clears throat> Excuse me, I uh, need some sugar. I'm having a, I'm diabetic, so I'm not gonna say sorry. <laughs> but, say sorry. Uh, can you? Okay, question. sure, sure. Um, candidate Frost. 
Repeat the question. Uh, what is your position on no bail for violent offenders and why? I think I'm going to stop it at that. Okay. That part of the question. Well, I believe that everybody should be allowed due process. Um, I believe that when someone is arrested for a violent crime, that a bail should be given um, because, you know, if, if the the crime is violent enough, then bills can be set at amounts that are pretty hard to meet. And if, you, if, if someone is given that opportunity to have bill, then there can also be stipulations that is put on that um, the defendant or the, the accuser, accused to make sure that they are awarded that due process and at the same time they are you know, put in a position of where they can't do much more harm uh, if they are released. Thank you. Um, candidate Pappas. Yeah, I'd really like to learn more about this no bail issue. Part of the problem, um, I've been on the Senate Judiciary Committee, but the committee chair hasn't had hearings on any of these important issues. Certainly starting with no bail for nonviolent offenders should be a given. Uh, but at what rate, the, how we should handle violent offenders, uh, maybe we could do something with, um, uh, I don't want to say house arrest, but uh, a, a tracking device that can keep track of where people are. It just it concerns me a little bit if you have someone who is a domestic abuser and, um, they, and they're accused of domestic abuse by their spouse, this is the most dangerous time for a woman, and this is when women get killed is when they try to separate, try to leave um, a violent uh, spouse or partner. So we have to think about this very carefully. I'm not really willing to make a position known until we have some hearings in the committee and that we do some more research about maybe what some other states or other countries even have done on this issue. Uh, candidate Holmgren. Uh, in initially, I would say I am opposed to the no bail practices that have been done. I don't know to the extent they're being done in the city of St. Paul or under Minnesota law or in Ramsey County, but you know, the, the worst case scenarios we see on Twitter or Facebook or on the news where someone has been arrested 35 times or something and now then they're released with no bail. Those, those are the cases where it's out of the question. I guess, you know, if it's a relationship type issue like Senator Pappas mentioned, yes, there should be a cooling off period or a time of sep sep separation. I don't think we can make a blanket statement here or at any time as to how that, those, that rule or that concept should be applied. Thank you. Uh, candidate Schoenbaum. No bail for violent offenders. Um, Number one, violence happens in a, in a terrible crime. Somebody has to be held to account. However, we are innocent until proven guilty. So that means you need to have a speedy trial. If somebody has committed a violent crime, they need to be tried quickly. They need to be, they need to address the problems that they, they caused. It's not just a problem for the victim, but it's a problem for the offender. The offender, the offender's life is better off if they actually, what do I say? Uh, letting them free doesn't help the offender. It certainly doesn't help the people that they're gonna hurt down the line. So it's not just a matter of protecting the victim. It's a, it's a matter of protecting the life of the, of the criminal, as it were, I guess. So they don't do it again. Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. Please repeat the question. Okay. Um, what is your position on no bail for violent offenders and why? It's not economic justice. Cash bail means, you know, your wealth determines whether you're in jail or not. Um, I support ending cash bail and investigating other criminal justice reforms but we need to focus on what's economic justice and we need to focus on who excels because of that. Numbers don't lie, right? Facts. Thank you. 
Um, candidate Sean Baum. This is a question about redlining. Insurance companies use redlining to issue insurance rates and low income and poor people are punished. Do you think it is fair to base insurance rates based on your zip code or credit score? Well, having lived in a, in a neighborhood that is not affluent for 30 years, I know that my insurance rates are higher than somebody who lives in Woodbury or, or Eden Prairie or whatever. It's hard. My car insurance is more expensive. My house insurance is more ex is expensive. Life insurance is more expensive. It doesn't address the individual needs of myself or my family. It is a little too broad a brush to paint for people who live in a neighborhood. So yes, we, we need to address the issues of redlining because it, it's, it's not an individual an address of, of a problem. Uh, candidate Pappas. This is an area where I might disagree with Paul, where I think we could use some more regulation mm -hmm. uh, so that insurance companies are not allowed to redline. Um, uh, candidate Perez Hedges. Your zip code and history <laughs> of racism shouldn't determine, all right, what your insurance is gonna be like. Um, I'm somebody that has been, somebody that's dealing with that right now. So, uh, you know, that's where I stand at that. Candidate Frost? I think it's totally unfair, and I don't think that insurance companies should be able to, to redline. That's just not fair. And uh, Candidate Holmgren? Well, there's two parts of that question. First part is redlining. Second part is your insurance rates based on your credit score. Well, all of banking and business and insurance products is based on your ability to pay. So if we're going to re regulate the insurance companies in that way, then it has to be fair to all the people paying insurance. Um, as far as redlining, if there's a covenant or something that goes back decades that is unfair to one group or another that should be out, outlawed. I mean, to I did say fewer regulations. I also think they should make sense. You should be able to explain them to your kids, you know, and not just have them so confusing that people can't figure them out. So we need we need equal I'm not even going to say the word right because I'm going to say the wrong word, but we need equality in our practices. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question, this will go to you, Candidate Frost. The state has $10 billion available to improve communities. Um, how would you propose spending that $10 billion? I think first we need to understand that we need to work together to make sure that those monies are being put into the community back into these communities the way that i would do it is public safety would be probably the first thing that i would use that money towards and with public safety it's being able to make make sure that our police departments have what they need uh, our community organizations have what they need with the resources that is gonna help those individuals that are involved in some of these issues in the community to make sure that the families that are, are homeless or that need uh, food to eat, they have resources to go to. So if we're talking about over $9 billion, then it's just, it's just mind blowing that uh, the Democrats and the Republicans can't seem to figure out, you know, how we can take just a little bit of that money and make sure that these, families here in these communities, you know, are, are well off. Thank you. Candidate Holmgren? I'm going to repeat something I said at a prior form, uh, hopefully accurately. I believe the, the, I don't know what percentage, but much of that money should go back to the people that paid the taxes. Uh, the balance of that should be 
spent in such a way that it buys down future budgets so that the budget increases doesn't go up 10, 15, 20% each by an, 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 annum. We should be able to figure out at the state level, the House and the Senate, what the balance is so we're not overtaxing the citizens and the taxpayers half the time and then when there's a budget shortfall, we don't have, have enough money to make a budget that makes sense. There has to be a way to buy down future budgets with some of that money, but it should return, be returned to the people that paid those taxes. Our candidate for us, Hedges. <clears throat> Focus on housing in our community, you know, increase development for affordable and public housing. There's way too many homeless folks with a budget of $10 billion. Come on now, we're living in a land of 10,000 lakes and more. We got the land in St. Paul of 10,000 more homeless throughout the state. Um, I've spoken with local organizations that are serving homeless people that don't have the capacity or space for how many homeless people are, are coming to St. Paul. And they deserve to have uh, a part of that budget go directing towards facilities that can house homeless people to get back and get those health care resources that they need to be able to live on their own. Accessibility for housing, affordable housing, and multicultural programming in that housing so that, you know, those young kids that are living as homeless kids learn what it is like to be, you know, economic economically uh, sufficient and, and, and literate. Uh, that's a very important key of what we need to be doing with our state's budget of $10 billion. Thank you. Um, candidate Pappas. So frustrating that it's sitting there in the bank and we have so many needs in our community. Um, I'd say that uh, responsibly to avoid the a future shortfall, and we could be heading into a recession, that we make sure that we have a healthy reserve so that that's taken care of. Um, I, would, I would agree that we could lower taxes, but I'd like to see lower taxes for working people and the renter's credit and the child care credit that can really help regular people. And we don't need to cut taxes on wealthy corporations. They've al already been doing well even during COVID. Um, invest in education. We have decades of underfunding. Both our E-12 system and our higher ed system has been mentioned. We have a housing crisis. There's a lot we can do there. Um, our transition toward universal health care, the dollars would help us with that. Plus, um, to develop a paid family leave program, we need a pot of money to begin with that. And I'd also like to see a pension program for low-wage workers, and that needs you know, maybe a half a million dollars to get that started. There's so many things we need to do. Candidate Schoenbaum. $10 billion, I think, is roughly the amount that was in excess of what the government spent in the last was it biennium. Um, it's that's a lot of money. That's an enormous amount of money that was taken beyond what was planned on being spent. I would say give it back. My neighbors are not rich. They could use reduction in their property taxes, they could use a reduction in their income taxes, they could use a reduction in their sales taxes. It is difficult when inflation is a 40 year high, when utility bills are higher than ever, this money should be given back to the people that paid it, the people that need it, the people that live in this community that are suffering under economic hardship at this point, it should be given back. Thank you. Um, what would you do to bring more business to Minnesota and make this state a destination for new business? Candidate Schoenbaum. What does, what does a business need when it wants to move or start? It, it needs a good workforce, and I think Minnesota has, as it always has, possessed uh, an excellent workforce. It has people that are educated. It has people that are hardworking, that are resourceful. We need businesses to understand that the workforce here is good, but we need to have a good tax climate where they're not going to pay more than they can afford. Small businesses, whether it's a coffee shop or a small manufacturing location, has to know that they won't pay more taxes than they can afford to, to pay. Otherwise, they will be somewhere else. St. Paul has not gained a lot of small businesses in the last 10, 20 years. 
there's a reason for that because there are too many regulations and there are too many taxes. It is too difficult for businesses to exist in St. Paul and that should be changed because this wonderful city of mine deserves to have good businesses, healthy businesses, strong businesses. Candidate Perez Hedges. We need to prioritize investing in our small businesses, specifically partnering our businesses that have survived in this COVID-19 pandemic. How do we keep our doors open? How do we help the business owner next to us? Um, we need to secure appropriation for BIPOC businesses that have been at a disadvantage, okay? We need to make sure that there is creative economic initiatives. I'm an artist, okay? If I have an idea in my field of work, that could braid into the infrastructure of development that's happening in this city, okay? Whether I speak a different language or not. We need to merge our businesses that have been surviving. We need to provide resources. The resources are there for those that know of the resources in an economic crisis. There needs to be more fields of tools for economic development, and that starts at not just waiting for a kid to be 18 years old to start a business, that needs to start in the infrastructure of after-school programming, teaching our kids about economics. Thank you. Candidate Pappas. I actually think it's a challenge to bring businesses from outstate to Minnesota because we're so weather-challenged. I think it's better if we focus on supporting home, homegrown businesses, uh, local people in the local community. We also, um, although we have a, a good workforce, we have a workforce shortage. So we can't brag that we have workers for a, to attract a business here. So we need to address those that are undertrained, that don't have the skills, they're underskilled, and also our immigrant population, which is very ambitious, but also needs to be more highly trained and we need to focus also to make sure we have good infrastructure, we have good roads, and we have good transit. Candidate Holmgren. As a tax repair and accountant, I, I believe I'm on the front, front lines of this. Uh, many of my clients, not the vast majority, but more of them every, every year come and ask me, I have this idea, how do I make it work? How do I incorporate my business? And so, two-part answer, uh, we need to remove barriers for all people to grow their idea and start their business here. Since it's tough to find someone to import their jobs here because of the, uns uns the unsteadiness of our tax code, we have to grow the businesses. I, I agree with that. And then we need to make it change the pattern of for five years we're going to have this grant, and then for three years we're going to have this program, and instead of developing a business, uh, companies are running their business model based on what the current tax code is. Uh, candidate Frost. Some tax breaks, tax incentives. We need to do some things like, you know, if we're going to ask businesses to come into Minnesota and, and start up and be um, be successful, we have to make sure the streets are safe for those businesses to come and do that. Whether you're existing businesses here or you're looking to come in from a different state, without safe streets, it's gonna be hard for businesses to, to operate, period, you know, because, you know, any business owner knows that in order to have a successful business, you need to be open. You need to be able to have you know, the chance to make, you know, that revenue and a safe street is what's going to help you be able to do that along with some tax uh, 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 tax breaks and some things that can help you build your business, those resources. Thank you. Um, this is a question about education. Do you support a voucher education program allowing the students uh, freedom to choose their school rather than their neighborhood? Candidate Frost. Yes, I think that... Uh, a child and a parent should be able to uh, have their kid go to school where they want their kid to go to school at. You know, that's that's only fair for the for that family. They shouldn't be uh, subject to only be educated by the school that's right there in in their area. They should be able to, if they have the means to, you know. Unfortunately, some of these outside. Um, the metro schools are better equipped with what it it what some all of our kids need, and 
Um, you know, if a kid can be able to get out there and take advantage of those resources that are being neglected in, in you know, the neighborhoods, then it's only fair that that kid and that parent has that opportunity. Uh, candidate Holmgren. I believe a voucher system is part of the answer to fixing the state's education pr problem. Uh, to what degree and how extensive it is, whether it's complete, a complete free-for-all or if it's something closer to what we have now where there's a wide open charter school system. Uh, all five of my kids are in charter schools. I have one in college, I guess. But So I, I would advocate and support a voucher system to what degree I don't have a specific plan at this point. Uh, all of our kids need a good education and the parents should choose where their kids go to school. Candidate Schoenbaum. I think vouchers in general are a good idea. Um, our children have gone to public schools in St. Paul and it has been some good and some bad and we have had some freedom to choose charter schools. Um, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, the amount spent average per child in St. Paul is pushing $30,000 a year. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, five or 10 years ago, it was 20, so I'm, I'm sure it is. That's a lot of money. I don't know many private schools that charge that much. So I think using vouchers to allow parents and students more opportunities, more competition, to win those students that are, are looking to do a good job would be a good thing. I, I don't know exactly how it would happen because it's, it's a tricky thing. Public schools are good, but they need some competition. Thank you. Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. Public schools need full funding from our state budget. Um, we need to have our communities stay in our communities. The schools should look like the barrios. The schools should look like the blocks. The schools should also have the Teachers of Color Act be pushed heavily so that we can fund educators that look like the student body. We need to make sure that there's food and nutrition in those schools. That's where the funding needs to go. You're going to talk about how much it costs per St. Paul kid to go to school. Let's cost how much it's going to cost. Let's talk about how much it's going to cost to keep those St. Paul kids in their school, in their neighborhoods, feeling multilingual education, having early childhood education in our neighborhoods that we've been a part of or that our new refuge children deserve an opportunity to learn about their culture and their communities. Let's talk about funding our schools, not dismantling our schools. Let's talk about funding educational curriculums that are going to provide and excel our students in those public schools, not sending them on a bus away from their neighborhoods. Let's keep the neighborhood in the neighborhood. Let's keep the schools for the school children. Candidate Pappas. Thank you. I um, agree with, um, with Maria that we need to fully fund our public schools. I believe that voucher programs um, undercut public education, and I don't support funding private schools or religious schools. In fact, I think it's unconstitutional. We have competition, as uh, the gentleman over here mentioned, with um, charter schools, which are also public schools. And we also have open enrollment so that, Mickey, you can actually send a child in St. Paul to a suburban school if you wish to do that. I door knocked today uh, a young girl who, was headed, who told me she was going to school in South St. Paul, and she lives in downtown St. Paul, so that those opportunities are there. But the basic thing is we still need to, to fund our core schools. Uh, going on to uh, the mental health crisis, how do you propose to address the critical mental health care shortages in Minnesota, especially in hospitals? Uh, candidate Pappas. We do have Bethesda Hospital that's opening as a mental health facility, so that should help. I think other hospitals are beginning to step up to have mental health beds, but we need mental health counselors in our schools and in our communities. We have a long way to go. I mentioned earlier that the legislature did pass some mental health funding. Um, I'm not sure how that's getting out to the community yet. I'd be happy to look into that more for the questioner. Um, but mental health is certainly a crisis that needs to be addressed. Certainly a lot of our homeless people are mentally, are mentally ill as well. Candidate John Baum. So what is the source of mental health crisis? Because it is a crisis. 
um, unemployment, um, family strife, drug abuse, uh, being a victim of a crime, being a perpetrator of a crime. There are all sorts of reasons why people have and are ongoing uh, mental health crises. Um, we need to deal with those underlying problems. We need to deal with why people are ending up in these desperate places. We need to understand why they lost their job. We need to understand why they lost their relationships. We need counseling to help them through these things. We need to support strength in families because families are one of the most important ways to get people through mental health crises. So I think we need to step back a little bit and look at why these crises are happening in the first place and address that. Candidate Perez Hedges. We need to support efforts that are guaranteeing health care and affordable health accessibility to you can't talk about how are we going to help out mental health without talking about helping out the overall health care. All right, as somebody that lives with a chronic illness, I can't just take care of one pit. <laughs> you got to take care of the whole spectrum. But if those opportunities aren't offered due to how much money we make, or if we can hold a conversation with doctors in our communities, or even in place trust within <clears throat> doctors in our communities, we need to address those matters. We need to fund uh, the clinics that are working out of our communities, specifically with our immigrant community that are just coming from the young to the elders. Those uh, such as like La Clinica, which is based out on the west side to open cities. These are clinics that have been there. There are resources that are there, but their doors could be shut depending on whether the state's going to fund them or not. So we need to make sure that there is room and space for mental health awareness in those spaces and that they're being discussed. Thank you. Uh, candidate Frost. We have $10 billion that's sitting in the bank and we have a mental health crisis. Maybe the ones with those mental health issues aren't the ones that's outside of those hospitals waiting to get in. Maybe it's some others. But the point of it is, is we need to be able to take that money that we do have and start to pay these workers that are trying desperately to be at these hospitals, to be in these, taking care of these people that are having these issues. We don't, we're not looked at as trying to give any of those workers the money that they need to make sure that we can all get through these, these crises that we say that we're having. We, we pay these workers barely what they're worth. They're worth a lot more than what they get paid. So we need to make sure that we can start to give those people that are taking care of all of us that, that have these issues what they deserve. Uh, candidate Holmgren. Uh, the mental health crisis is much deeper than state funding or programs. It's a crisis of the heart. And I'm not, I'm not going to advocate less resources at this point. I don't, I think we probably need more. I, I would agree with most of the people here. We need more, but it's how we do it. It's, it's structure. It's let's structure the money right so it gets to the where it needs to go. It's not. It's not the size of the check. It's the impact of the check. Somebody might need fifty dollars. They don't need a thousand dollars today. Will they need that thousand in the future? Yes. You know, let's pay the professionals to do the work. Let's have the programs available to the people that need it. Let's cut the red tape so they're not waiting months to be serviced. And then we're doing suicide prevention or dealing with violent crime. Let's get to the root of the problem. Um, candidate Holmgren, what changes in voting rights legislation do you support and why? Candidate Holmgren? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. You said Schonenbaum. Uh, voting rights legislation. Uh, well, here we are back at the education process of how to be a citizen. Civics 101 should be taught not just in eighth grade or sixth grade or whatever grade it's taught. It should be taught every, every year, even if it's 
one week of school. Um, and so by the time a person turns 18, they're ready to vote. They're, they can discuss the issues with their parents and their grandparents and their friends and their neighbors. And so we're not so pol pol polarized in our views. Access to voting is an issue. Yes, we should not have those barriers. But at the same time, we want citizens to vote. We want people that are part of the community. We don't want people outside the community coming in to take, dilute our, our votes. Uh, candidate Perez Hedges. We need to look at, I, I'm, I'm gonna give a personal experience with this. My uncle, you know, was locked up as a felon for 14 years. And when he came out, he wasn't able to vote. He had to go through so many different steps in the system to be able to gain that vote. Um, he, after years of, of finally accomplishing that and getting off paper, but working for the state and providing for this economy, he was able to vote for me for, uh, for the first time in this primary. We need to make sure that if a person does the time, they did the time and they're out, they have accessibility to be able to vote for who's building in those communities so that maybe they don't have to take the same routes of what systemic oppression gives. We also need to talk about our immigrant rights when it comes to voting. If somebody has been here long enough to serve and build our community, they should have the accessibility to get a little bit of help to be naturalized as a citizen so that their vote does count because they're building this economy. They are working in these hard jobs and labors, though they deserve to be able to vote for the, per the people who are making sure that those laws are passed for them and their safety. Candidate Joan Baum. So the question was regarding changes in uh, voting rights legislation. I'm sure that there are a lot of rules about voting rights and everybody has a right to vote and everybody has an obligation to vote. I'm not sure what kind of changes we need to make, but I know that if you're 18 and you're living in St. Paul, you should vote. You should do research, and you should vote. You should not have your opinion denigrated. You should not have your, your vote diluted in any way. You should not be uh, made uh, access to the voting booth should not be made difficult at all. You should vote. And you should be given access to to transportation, to the voting, whatever. It's, I'm not sure exactly what legislation we're gonna change to do it, but it's, everybody should vote. Candidate Frost. We have to ensure the people that voting is real and that it works. We can't, we can't sit back and want people to vote. And when they do, we televise blatant lies. And, and, and we show that, you know, what we all look forward to, to making right with our vote isn't being taken serious. So it's kind of hard to, you know, uh, change anything if the uh, people that are out there, you know, going to vote, and once they go vote, they have to sit back and watch where their vote is, they're being lied to about their vote or attempted to be lied to about their vote. So we have to be honest and change the perception of how people look at voting. Uh, candidate Pappas. I don't know if I can address this in one minute because it's such an important issue in terms of the future of our democracy that we, we have in every state, almost every state, we have good, clean, fair systems that have been in place for decades and decades. And now they're being attacked. And there are lies out there about who won the 2020 election. And it, I think that there are already people talking about if they don't win the 2024 election, then they're gonna say it's not a fair election. We're just heading to, down the road toward autocracy. I think that in Minnesota, we've had a very good system. We have early voting. We have same day registration. You can register and vote on election day. We have vote by mail. We absolutely need to restore voting rights to felons. Um, something else that we could do that would be unique is to start registering high school seniors so that they're all ready to vote by the time they're 18. I know some political science teachers do that, give that option to their seniors. 
and something that's rather unique. Other, some other countries also allow young people to vote at 16. More later. Uh, thank you, candidates. We're going to move on to the closing remarks, but before we do that, I really want to thank the audience for these questions. They are fabulous. Um, I appreciate your time and effort and um, being here tonight to um, talk to the candidates. So we're going to do closing arguments, two minutes each. Uh, candidate Schoenbaum. First of all, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak in front of a camera and speak in front of the other candidates and the audience. It's, it's a wonderful thing. We have, we have a good thing here. We sit in front of you, we present our opinions, we present our propositions, and you consider them, and you vote. It's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, candidate Pappas. Um, I'd also like to express my thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk to voters um, on SPIN, St. Paul Neighborhood Network. Um, I did want to express the regrets of my, uh, my colleague candidate, Samakab Hussein, who I talked to this morning, who is ill, who is heading to urgent care, and we wish him a speedy recovery. <clears throat> I, um, um, I also, the uh, members of the audience that I mentioned, that I'd be glad to assist you with your questions. Feel free to talk to me. And if anyone listening at home also has questions about the legislative process or things that assistance you might be able to get from the legislature, please feel free to call or email my office. You can find it on the legislature's website. Um, uh, there are so many things that need to be done in our state. We have a wonderful state, we have a wonderful city, we have wonderful communities, uh, but they are struggling. And COVID really showed us a lot of problems in our system, whether it's affordable housing whether, and homelessness, whether it's access to health care, um, the whole issue with the importance of vaccines and the disagreement over the importance of having a, a health crisis, the mental health crisis we talked about, Education certainly is key, and job training is key to the future of our state and getting more people in the workforce at higher paid jobs. We talk about family wages, not just minimum wages anymore. Um, it's a struggle, and also we, have the, we haven't talked at all about the climate crisis that's facing us. We're in the middle of a drought, um, and we have, uh, we have water in Minnesota. Other states are jealous of us, but yet we still have a drought in Minnesota. And, unusual weather occurrences throughout the country that have created problems for our neighbors uh, in different parts of the country, in California and Florida and Puerto Rico and all and other parts of the country. And certainly my heart goes out to everyone who has suffered from some of those weather, uh, weather occurrences. Um, lots of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, candidate Holmgren. Where do we go from here? Thank you for holding this event. Thank you for everybody for coming. Otherwise, I'd be sitting at home. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, we have a choice to make. Everyone that's watching and listening, everyone who votes has a choice to make for a better state, a better future. And what is that choice going to be? Um, my entire life, every time they've drawn up a new budget at the state, it's grown larger. It's put a larger burden on myself, my family, my clients, whether it's property taxes at the county level, whether it's income taxes or sales taxes. I know I'm, it sounds like I'm the parrot in the room, it's the only one talking about it, but we need to know what our government does, how effective it is, what it costs, why it grows during recessions and it doesn't stop growing. And so if we want to be able to afford to live in this city, we need to know where our money goes, what it's going for, and know that it's getting to where it needs to go. I don't think we should just wholesale cut programs left and right because we feel like it, nor should we just increase them because there's a need one year and then never review it in the next three or five years. You know, our lives should be so simple we can explain to our kids in the car instead of, you know, telling jokes about why there's f fences around cemetery.
ter Terry's, which my kids love to parrot every time I'm on the road. You know, the verse from the Bible, I, I don't want to quote too much, but tell your kids when you walk in the way, when you sit down, when you go to sleep, our lives should be to where we can explain them to our children and they follow us as good citizens. Uh, thank you. Candidate Perez Hedges. It's been a great evening spending it all with our audience. Many thanks to the League of Women Voters and to SPNN and the walls that the great Kwame McDowell uh, provided in community for someone who was born and raised in this indigenous land of Minnesota as a Boricua and as a mother. I want everyone at home and those that are here to recognize the importance of what November 8th is in every election day for our children, for our youth, who deserve to excel to their highest potential. And we have had too many of them with lives cut short due to violence, gun violence, due to health disparities, okay, due to this opiates crisis. I, as a youth worker, am tired of going to funerals for my students. I also want to hold the memories of our elders who gave us wisdom to be in these spaces right now, to keep fighting, to keep saying power to the people, to keep saying siempre pa'lante like the young lords and the 13-point platforms that are not taught to us in our school books. They deserve to be there. We are living on this land that AIM has fought for, and the children of AIM are still fighting for that. All right, I look forward to representing 65B after election day, and I'm speaking it to an existence because our kids deserve to see leadership that is spoken and has grown from community, raised by community, and not forgetting what community looks like. This is about education, y'all. Let's educate each other. Let's have conversations. You can find more information about me at peopleformariaisa.org. We can agree to disagree, but we gotta keep moving forward, or we can agree on how we can keep building this place as best as it can. Like the like my sister Zainab Muhammad, who's running for Senate in Minneapolis, says, let's make it easier, not harder. And like the people from Maria Isa say, the time is here, the time is now. Let's do this. Muchas gracias. A candidate Frost. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, I hope that you got some of the answers that, uh, that you've been seeking from these candidates here. But I just want you to ask yourself this question. Aren't you tired of the games that these politicians are continuing to play? Aren't you tired of claiming to be an American, but you have to pick a side in order to be an American? You have to be either this way, you gotta be that way. Isn't them days long, shouldn't they be long gone? It's time for us right now to start to take us back, take our communities back, get them out of the hands of these people that don't live in these communities, but come into our communities all day and make the changes or attempt to make the laws for us, but they don't really understand what we go through on, in these communities. It's just not fair to any one of us. We need somebody that in our areas that we want to represent, and in my case, it's 65A. I come from this neighborhood. I was born and raised right here in this neighborhood. I do the work right now. I don't have to wait till I become a politician to make sure that these kids eat every day, to make sure that you know this gun violence stops, to make sure that you know there's not another shooting that takes place. I do all that now to make sure the families eat, to make sure that you know these schools have a true center inside of those schools to deal with those kids that are fighting and having those issues at school. I'm in a juvenile detention center right now. I'm there every week where I go down there and I sit there with those young young men and women that have made mistakes and they feel like that there's no way out but I ensure them that it's just a mistake and there is a way out so when they come out of those incarcerated situations I give them those resources that they need to move forward those jobs those housing opportunities I do all that now I don't need a special title or anything on my name to make sure that I continue to do this work because that's what's instilled inside of me and it's really called community it's being there to make sure that my community has those things, those resources, and everything. My opponents, are they doing the work? I don't see none of them doing the work that I do right now. And with me, you get another day, you get another chance, and I hope to see you all November the 8th. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to also thank the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, um, the St. Paul chapter of the NAACP, and the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. This was a wonderful forum. It was my pleasure to moderate it. And have a safe evening, everybody.